of Spirit Lake, uh, and it just begs people to uh, do crazy things like dive into the water to find out if there's any anything down there at the bottom, which is a really stupid thing to do given the visibility in the water is about 12 feet. Um, in other words, 12 feet beneath the surface is absolute darkness all the way down to, uh, to the bottom at 100 feet. Okay, it's got the consistency of tea. Uh, and it's 35, 36 degree temperature water. There's a floating log mat on top. You go down at one point where there ain't no log mat and you come up a little bit later and there's a log mat there with three and four foot diameter logs rolling against one another. They, those things do nasty things to heads. I mean, this is not, and then of course, besides that, you got this active volcano right there, which has blown up five times uh, since the eruption to the point that they were doing the, the, uh, the diving. So, you know, it's something you shouldn't tell your mother about. <clears throat> but alas, he had to go down there to find out what was in there and uh, didn't tell his mom. Uh, I don't know if she still even knows. Uh, the, down at the bottom, there are places where there are up to three feet of bark at the bottom of the lake from the logs on the surface. And this is not actually a piece of bark. This is actually a piece of log on top of a layer of bark down there on the bottom. So this, I believe, his log mat hypothesis, which was proposed in 1979 in the PhD dissertation, explains these. And he also pointed out that if you follow uh, uh, coal seams laterally, they eventually laterally become equivalent to marine beds. So it also explains why you've got lateral equivalents to marine beds. Now at the same time, this, oh, by the way, so the floating forest hypothesis, if these are the trees in the middle of the forest, at the final, the final say, after the whole forest has been destroyed, what do you have left? You only have left the logs from the largest trees. And so now you have a humongous floating log mat that would explain the origin of coal using Steve Austin's hypothesis. So the floating forest hypothesis pulls Steve Austin's theory in as well. In addition, of course, we have observed, uh, for example, ICR's rate project, which you recently heard about, uh, the evidence for um, the youth of coal, uh, that it's dating in only thousands of radiocarbon years, uh, would also be explained in this hypothesis if, in fact, the, uh, the, uh, the coal was generated during the flood, which is only thousands of years ago. So this hypothesis explains the flat top flat base, thin benches, chunks of bark, laterally grad lateral gradation with marine sedimentation, the youth of coal, and it explains the humongous biomass of coal if you assume that this floating forest is basically the size of a continent. We're not talking about a little itty bitty thing. Take all the mass of the coal in the whole world and put it back into a forest, you've got a very large forest. I would suggest you've got another continent and we get 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by ocean right now. There's plenty of room for another continent, a big one. You could put another North American continent out there in the size of a floating forest. It also explains why the coal is found across eastern United States and eastern uh, or western Europe at a time when those two things were together. The entirety, all the way to the Eurasian, uh, the Europe-Asian uh, boundary and from that point all the way out past Missouri is where you find this coal and you've got this huge log mat floating back and forth in the in the wind producing this uh, this distribution it explains I believe also why you'll find up to 120 coal seams in a given region as this thing is being blown back and forth uh, sedimentation is continuous but the coal is being, being deposited only underneath the floating forest, wherever floating log mat at that point, all that's left. And it would explain that the, from the bottom of the coal, from the lowest coal seam to the uppermost coal seam, you have no change in biota. There's no change in species. There's no change in species of plants. There's no change in species of animals. For my dissertation, I worked on Lingula mitaloides and Lingula squamiferous, which are two um, brachiopod species that are found in the coal measures. By the conventional dating, there's 100 million years of coal measures. 
from the bottom of the coal, top of the coal, is 100 million years, and there's the species that you find at the bottom are exactly the same species as at the top. 100 million years of no change in species if you accept the traditional understanding. So this would explain why you've only got one species, because it's one forest, and you're depositing stuff from the same forest up the entire sequence. Another side benefit that I didn't realize initially, but began to realize when, I, when, I, when some, some people uh, started reminding me of some things I hadn't tried to explain, would be the Paleozoic stratomorphic intermediates. There are claims of critters in the Paleozoic that are supposed to be intermediate between uh, evolutionary groups. For example, actually, there are only two plant species I know of that are claimed to be evolutionary intermediates. Only two. There are no inter invertebrate intermediates that I know of, and that's 95% of the fossil record right there, or none. And then among the vertebrates, the only ones known in the Paleozoic are the two, two plant species, Aglophyton and Baraguanathia, and the, there, are, there are four or five fish amphibian intermediates, and there's the recent Tiktaalik, which is a fish amphibian intermediate. In other words, this, this puppy is more like a fish than it is an amphibian. This is more like an amphibian than it is a fish, but it's not an amphibian. Okay? This thing does not have enough strength in its legs to walk on its legs, but it uses its legs. It's clear from the fossil information that it does. How does that work? Well, the floating forest, I suggest, explains how. Because you have, you have ponds in the middle of the floating forest. Remember what I said about the bottom of this floating forest? You get to a point where you can't stand up on this puppy. You'll go through it. So what is the best design? The best design is to be able to utilize the bottom but not put any pressure on it. How do you not put any pressure on it if you float yourself? So God would design an organism which actually floats in the water but can use the bottom. And that would be designed for these, these pools on the edge of the floating forest. And then you'd have fish that are actually designed to live in that, above that false bottom.